Hi, everyone. How are we doing on uh, quorum, Craig? We have a little bit to go. Okay. We will wait. Just another note for anybody joining us from a phone tonight, you'll be able to press star nine uh, to indicate that you'd like to speak at the appropriate time. So just to let everyone know, we're waiting for a few more of our members before we start the meeting. Looks like people are still on summertime. Okay, we're good. Okay, it's a go. So hi everybody, welcome back from the summer hiatus. And I'll start the meeting by going over um, the, what the procedures actually are. So as usual, we'll begin by hearing from our elected officials who are in attendance and who wish to speak. And then uh, if they would use the raised hand feature uh, when I call on the electeds. A after the electeds, uh, any representatives of others who may uh, report to the board for two minutes each, we then enter the public session, which is an opportunity for anyone from the public to bring information to the board. 
So anyone wishing to speak, please sign up by 6.30. After 6.30, um, as, you know, as usual, that's the closure. Be sure to include the subject you'll be addressing as well as contact information, just in case we need to do so. And remember, there's a time limit of two minutes. Please respect the time constraints that the board faces during each of its meetings. The public session is then followed by the business session. This is when the board enters into a session which consists of the adoption of the minutes, the chair's report, committee reports, resolutions, questions and comments, period, and voting. Uh, if there are any comments or questions from either the applicants or the public or if additional information is ever needed, that's allowed only with the chair's approval. So having said all that, I'd like to start with our electives and I know we have our borough president, Gail Brewer on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I, I just wanna say something funny, which is I know you might not like it as board members, but the Ferris wheel wasn't a bad ride. I just wanna let you know, um, I did go, I know they didn't give you much notice. I'm quite aware of that, um, but they are bringing, people are doing things that you and I may not. They're flying in from like Arizona just to go on the ride. So it's helping in terms of the economy and uh, a plus for our city. So I, I just thought I would start with that as a joke kind of. Um, I do wanna say um, Empire Station Complex, the one's the project that you have been working so hard on. I think this is an example where I'm delighted that we have a new governor and a new fresh discussion of the topic. I don't know where it's gonna go, but um, I think you've heard her, some of her comments as I have already, and at least it's much more of an open discussion. So that's a positive. Um, I do wanna mention the Commodore or the Grand Hyatt, depending on what you call it. Um, I, I am pleased the part that we all worked on, there's many aspects to it. Obviously the, hopefully the FAR is a 4.27 and you know, we gotta work on that issue. But, but the other issue is just the open space, which I hope will actually be used and will be open space. And I think we all push to have it closed overnight only, not during the day to accommodate the cleaning, but it has to be open. And that's what we must be cognizant of. Um, I don't wanna thank you for your comments about 415 Madison. And then in terms of 343 Madison, which I call the MTA building, I keep calling it that. Um, I hope this sticks and it's very minor. It's not so much a land use issue, but we included in our ULIP, as I'm sure you saw, and I think council member Powers will support it, which is that obviously many of these buildings do the mural and they do other art things, but this particular building, if it stands, will include space for a working artist free of charge, like either 500 or 1,000 square feet. And I guess as somebody like you who knows how hard it is for the arts to survive in our city, having every new building have a, a real component for the arts, it's not gonna kill the bottom line. And um, it's, it's what makes the you know, Jazz at Lincoln Center, thank goodness for them at Time Warner, and I can go on and on about the places that have the arts that make a difference. So let's just hope that every new building has something similar. They also promise that when they are between rentals, they will put in something like Shoshama or these working artists in that public space. It makes a huge difference to the public. Um, we're all working on the Fifth Avenue busway resolution. I'm swamped with emails, as you can imagine, not happy. Um, I think that the work that you did, uh, listening to the community late that it may be in terms of presentation from the city and also the work that um, the Fifth Avenue Association has done. So we'll see where it ends up. I do know the bus has to move. I know the DOT made some compromises in terms of uh, the turning lanes down to two. I know that Cardinal Dolan is upset because of his need for his funerals and other church related activities. Um, but so we'll see, I mean, I do support the notion of getting the bus to move. We all support the bikeway. So I just wanna let you know, I'm cognizant of the work that you've done on that. And we've certainly been active in, in that issue. Um, I just wanna say that uh, we are, if you haven't already, every three, every three o'clock time period on a Tuesday, we have these uh, either vaccine discussions or I call them, where is the federal money going in the city of New York? 
and uh, we have hundreds of people signing on. This week, we're going to have two speakers, one on the education money, which is in the billions coming to the city of New York. Where is it going? And then also uh, climate change and money for that. So you're welcome to join us. I have to say uh, we keep it three to four and people who have been attending on a regular basis find them very, very helpful because I don't think it's it's uh, everywhere that you're getting that kind of information. I'm really happy that James Katz is the new Manhattan Deputy Borough President. Matthew Washington, whom we love, is now working for a large nonprofit. Uh, as you probably know, uh, James Katz was the Chief of Staff at EDC, and he's going to help us with many of the issues that we are constantly uh, confronting. <clears throat> I want to mention um, we joined DOT and others with an electric vehicle charging station press conference on the Lower East Side in a municipal uh, garage. And I, I just thought it's all of the uh, boards should have a discussion because it's my understanding that EV uh, electronic vehicle charging stations are gonna pop up in different places. I've already started to see them and people don't know what they are. Uh, people are parking in the spaces where there is an opportunity to charge your car. Uh, DOT has lots of numbers as to how by 2024 is gonna be a change of uh, vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So something to put on your radar. Um, I think that it's a lot of uh, education is definitely needed. On the education front, I must admit, I know this may be controversial, but uh, right now, a lot of parents will be in school with their kids, put their kids in schools. And I tell you, a lot of parents are not gonna do it. I don't care what you tell them. So the mayor doesn't have a plan B. So with Public Advocate Williams and Chair Traeger of the Education Committee, we had a press conference saying, what's your plan B? And I think informally, the superintendents from me listening to them talk at different meetings are gonna just work it out some way, but that's not the way to do it. You need to have a plan. So just so you know, I'm nervous about the start of school this year. Maybe others are not, but it does make me nervous. And you do have a lot of schools on board five. Um, I know that on September 23rd at 8.30 is our Manhattan Borough Board meeting, and we'll be talking about open restaurants, which is always an issue, and also the New York State Independent Redistricting Commission is going to make uh, a presentation, something that will certainly be of interest, I think, to everybody. Um, and then want to mention, we all know about the eviction moratorium being extended. I just left uh, Catholic Charities, and I know they're trying as hard as they can. They're definitely in your area, trying to make sure that people get the form filled out so they don't lose their apartments. Um, and then we're also working, we have an art survey and we're gonna be uh, making sure mm -hmm. that our gallery has uh, is taking in ideas about, uh, and, and um, all kinds of paintings regarding the pandemic. And we'll have an exhibit sometime at the end of the year. I know that the um, virtual public meetings are now reality, I wanna thank you. Thanks to your work on open government and the work that you did to make that happen. Let's see where that goes. I know there is some pushback from uh, some of the good government groups, understandably. So I assume you're working with them because I think you have a very good reason for doing what you're doing. Um, and we're always pushing the composting. I want to just mention, and we'll put this in the chat. You don't, you know, lots of the time, the money that goes to capital money from us, it goes into board five is often organizations that have their headquarters on board five, but sometimes they do their work at other places. But we did put in um, 788,000 towards cultural institutions, 400,000 towards schools, another 375 uh, for, uh, I think, parks, and uh, another 138,000 for nonprofit organizations. I just wanna let you know, and um, thank you very much, Community Board Five. There's still a lot of work to be done, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Glad you could stop by. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, that takes us to, um, I don't believe we have any other electeds, but we will go to their reps. So we have Justin Flagg from Senator Kruger. Hello, this is Justin from Senator Kruger. I apologize. My camera decided to uh, take the opportunity to stop working at this inopportune time. So um, you can't see me. I wore my Zoom shirt and everything, so it, but it was for naught. Um, so as the borough president mentioned last week, there was a special session of the legislature uh, where they extended the eviction and foreclosure moratoriums. 
um, as well as the Tenant Safe Harbor Act and uh, the eviction and foreclosure moratoriums for small businesses. Uh, the legislature also expand, expanded the COVID Emergency Rental Assistance Program known as CRAP and extended the ability of state and local government bodies to meet remotely, as you know, since that's why we're um, having this remote meeting. The moratoriums were extended until January 15th. CRAP was expanded to cover localities that had previously opted out, as well as creating an opportunity for landlords and lenders to challenge hardship declarations in court. And it added a nuisance standard to allow landlords to start eviction proceedings if a tenant is a nuisance or has inflicted substantial damage to a property. And judges are also directed to require residential tenants to apply for CRAP if their hardship claim is challenged and found to be valid. So I would urge any tenants or landlords who are eligible for CRAP to apply as soon as possible. The application process is running a lot more smoothly than it was initially, and Governor Hochul has significantly increased the uh, rate of money getting out the door and into the hands of landlords. I'll put a link in the chat to the OTADA website that has more information. Um, and the MTA is set to finally begin the process of developing the environmental assessment for the congestion pricing program, which includes a public consultation period. They have a website up with all the relevant information. I'll put that in the chat. And there will be a series of meetings where the public can share their thoughts and concerns. Uh, the meeting for Manhattan below 60th Street is on September 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, you can register online. I will we'll put that link uh, in the chat as well. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, Justin. We miss seeing you. <laughs> okay, next up will be Lori. For the Hi, thank you. Hi, Lori. Hi, uh, Lori from Speaker Johnson's office. I would have loved to have seen Justin's shirt too. I <laughs> you should describe it for us. But um, <laughs> anyway, I have three events uh, from the Speaker's office to share. Um, we will be hosting um, our annual community resource fair on the High Line uh, on Thursday, September 23rd from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's rain or shine, um, it's outdoors, but there is covering. Uh, attendees can enter at 14th and 10th Avenue. Um, the New York City Health and Hospitals, we'll be offering COVID-19 vaccinations. Uh, in addition, there'll be blood pressure uh, tests, flu shots, and resources from dozens of nonprofits and city agencies. They'll be available to answer questions and give out information. We are strongly recommending that everyone wear a mask. Um, and then on Saturday, September 25th, we'll be having a bike helmet fitting and giveaway at DeWitt Clinton Park, 54, West 54th Street and 11th Ave. Um, Helmets will be distributed following all social distancing protocols and they'll only be given to those who are present. Children under 18 need to be there with a parent so they um, will be able to sign a waiver. Uh, and finally, we are starting our food bag program for seniors again. Um, our office has been sponsoring this program in our district with um, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for several years. Um, the first sign up will be September 20th. And the program will run through November. The final delivery date will be November 10th. Um, and there'll be six locations where people can sign up. I'm gonna send the flyer to Marissa so she can share those locations. Um, and I can also try to put it in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lori. Next up will be Betsy Schmidt. Let me on, there we go. Um, okay, today Congresswoman Maloney uh, met with leaders in the New York fashion industry at Spring Studio to kick off New York Fashion Week um, with an in reinvigorating New York's fashion economy, a panel discussion on the future of the industry in New York City. The group's discussion highlighted fashion as a key economic driver and one critical to New York City's recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. On Tuesday, the Congresswoman uh, joined President Biden, Governor Hochul, and other members of the New York City uh, delegation to discuss the devastation caused last week by Hurricane Ida. More than 7,000 people have already registered for financial assistance. If you have not, but you need to, you can register um, at disasterassistance.gov. Um, so that's with FEMA. Um, last Thursday, uh, the Congresswoman chaired an important markup hearing on the Committee of Oversight and Reform that looked at provisions of the Build Back Better Act 
Uh, this included uh, critical funding to electrify the General Services Administration and the Postal Service vehicle fleets. So we'll need those EV charging stations um, and funding to make needed capital improvements to postal service infrastructure. Um, the Congresswoman voted on Oh, I'm gonna mess the date now, whatever, in mid-August, she voted on uh, HR4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which would restore critical protections of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, and finally, a new report was released in August that showed there are an estimated 30,000 people in our district who currently purchase health insurance on the individual marketplace and could benefit from the American Rescue Plan's extended tax credits. Um, so we're really pushing people, um, if they're uninsured or previously earned too much to receive a tax credit, to sign up um, at newyorkstateofhealth.newyork.gov. Um, and people, enrollees already receiving financial assistance may also make changes to their information if you make less money now or change jobs um, to select a new plan. And with New York State extending the open enrollment period through December 31st, people still have time to get on that. So um, that's all for me. Okay, thank you very much. The next one up will be Erica Overton. Hi everyone, I'm Erica Overton I'm from Assembly Member Linda B. Rosenthal's office. I just wanna take a second to introduce our newest uh, CB uh, community board liaison, um, Alex Levin. Um, he is on the call and if you wanna say hello, um, Alex. <laughs> um, everyone, nice to meet you. <laughs> There he is. Um, and very, so very quickly, um, as everyone mentioned, the assembly member was very happy to go back to Albany last week um, to extend the eviction moratorium. Um, she was surprised um, by the Supreme Court's decision to, um, to essentially say the, the eviction ban was not a thing. Um, 750,000 people were, you know, slated to lose their home throughout the, throughout the United States. Um, and so they went back to, to, um, extend it. Um, so it will now be until January 15th, 2022. Um, however, in that time period, it is essential that ERAP, the emergency rental assistance program, get out as much money as possible. The assembly member is the chair of the social services committee in the assembly and held a hearing on the efficacy of the ERAP program in August. Um, at that point, it had given out a sliver of money um, and tenants, landlords, and advocates, advocates were all very upset by it. Um, and so now it's starting to get a little bit better um, as it was previously mentioned with Governor Hochul. So we'll continue to do that. If anyone has an issue, they can call our office. Um, we have been trying to expedite those um, applications as possible. Um, and then Anna, it's partly a federal issue, but the United States Postal Service, um, we are having a lot of constituent complaints of people who are not getting mail. Um, and so the assembly member wrote a letter and we later signed on um, to a letter with Congressman Nadler about it. Um, and it's still happening. Um, and so there are buildings that are just not receiving anything for weeks at a time. Um, so we are working with the local post offices um, and supervisors to get people their mail. Um, they're missing checks. They're missing important notices from Department of Labor, all of those things. Sorry. Last thing, mammogram day. We are hosting a free mammogram day on December 8th. So if anyone needs one, please give our office a call and we'll schedule you in. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I do think, though, that Senator Hoyleman has joined us. Brad, are you on? Yes. Okay. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Hi, Vicki. Good to see everyone. Uh, State Senator Brad Hoyleman here. I hope everyone had a relaxing summer in the midst of so much drama in Albany and good news uh, and bad news uh, both around uh, COVID. Um, I know we're all battling um, to stay healthy, uh, wearing face masks where appropriate and uh, making sure that our neighbors um, are vaccinated. Wanted to let you know that I joined the uh, vaccination trial uh, for the booster uh, at NYU Langone. Uh, I was in the original trial for the, for the first uh, vaccine under Pfizer and now I'm in the booster trial. So, so far so good. Uh, I think boosters are gonna be part of our uh, reality uh, shortly and I think they're already being recommended for folks who are immunocompromised uh, or older New Yorkers. Um, secondly, wanted to introduce um, my new campaign uh, 
former campaign colleague and now legislative aide in my office, Justin Shea, who's on the line. He'll be covering uh, CB5 and working closely with you. Um, hello, Justin. Uh, uh, and I, a lot of great colleagues you'll be working with uh, here uh, at CB5. Uh, third, uh, Vicky, just wanted to uh, uh, say that I'm, I'm grateful to Assemblymember Rosenthal and all of my colleagues who passed uh, the legislation during the extraordinary session to extend the eviction moratorium. Uh, we've also extended legislation that I wrote uh, as part of that package called the Tenant Safe Harbor Act. Uh, which I passed back um, over a year ago. It will be extended to January 15th, 2022. And that means uh, a court uh, will never be able to use unpaid rent that accrued uh, during the COVID-19 period, even after the eviction uh, moratorium elapses as the basis mm -hmm. for a non-payment eviction of a financially burdened tenant. Uh, and along with uh, our assembly colleagues and uh, council members in the borough president's office, if anyone needs help uh, uh, applying for uh, the COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program, uh, they should contact uh, Justin or, or our office at 212-633-8052. As part of that extraordinary session, I know this was an issue of importance to community boards. Um, the Senate uh, and Assembly passed uh, a temporary extension of the um, legislation that will allow uh, public meetings to remain remote uh, until January 15th. That's an important uh, public health measure. Um, I've been fighting to allow public meetings hosted by community boards and CECs and other public bodies to be uh, available remotely and online. Uh, I think we still need to pass the legislation that I carry. Uh, there are other companion bills in Albany along these lines, but this is a great step. Uh, and I'm glad that the governor signed that into law right away. So we've been able to have this meeting. Um, I'm supporting a legislation that would add immunization against COVID-19 to the list of vaccines children are required to receive to attend school in New York State. Um, I think this is gonna be the wave of the future uh, to combat future uh, pandemic waves. Um, the legislation that I, that I hope to uh, introduce would take effect 30 days after full FDA approval of, uh, of a vaccine, full FDA approval of a vaccine for children. Um, Fifth, I just wanted to uh, thank CB5 for their work, uh, in particular, uh, Layla, uh, on the Empire Station Complex. And, and thank you, uh, Vicky, for all of our conversations. Um, the working group that was uh, assembled around the Empire Station Complex has submitted a comprehensive set of recommendations to Empire State Development. Uh, and I hope the governor hews closely to those recommendations when looking at this project. Uh, the project has two very important pieces which kind of get lost in all the real estate, which is expanding Penn Station to make it this the most, the busiest transit hub in the country, um, much more friendly to, uh, to passengers who use that. Uh, and secondly, to make sure that Gateway has a platform through the extension of the tunnels from New Jersey. But based on what you see from uh, ESD, it's really a real estate project of 20 million square feet that's larger than Hudson Yards. So I hope the governor looks at this closely and the recommendations of the working group so we can get this project uh, right size and uh, on the right track. Um, that's really it for me right now. Vicki, thank you so much. Uh, good to see everyone. Okay, thank you, Brad. We're particularly grateful for those legislative actions and the, the open meetings law in particular. So thanks again, and thanks for coming by this evening. Okay, let's see. Next up, we have Alexis Richards.
Yes, hello, thank you. Um, first, I want to take a quick minute to in second to introduce myself. I know you're probably used to seeing Jeremy Unger here. Um, he has left our office, so I am Alexis. I'm the Communications Director and CB5 Liaison and Council Member Rivera's office. I am new to CB5, but I've been with the Council Member since January of 2020, so just in time for the pandemic. Um, if you ever need to get in touch with us, please feel free to email me. I'll put my email address and our phone number in the chat. Um, don't want to take up too much time, but today it, at the Council Stated Meeting, we passed groundbreaking legislation to create a primary care services patient navigation program to better connect uninsured New Yorkers mm -hmm. to healthcare citywide. And the council member was a co-sponsor of that legislation. In September on the 24th and 30th, the councilwoman as chair of the committee on hospitals will hold two hearings. Um, the first is with regard to resident following an alarming trend of residents dying by suicide. On the 30th, we'll be co-chairing an oversight hearing on vaccine mandates for municipal employees jointly with the Committee on Health. Um, if you have any, if you want to testify at those hearings, you can write testimony at council.nyc.gov. At the end of July, the council member joined with council member Sylvina Brooks Powers to introduce a new bill to amend the Gender Motivated Violence Act, which was passed in 2000 by the council. If passed, this bill will create a two-year look back window for survivors of assault to file civil actions using the GMBA, even if the statute of limitations has expired. Um, and then finally, we will be hosting mobile office hours at the Kipps Bay Library on Thursday, September 16th from 12 to 2, if you want to just walk over a few avenues and say hi. And that's everything from our office. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, I think our last representative of the electeds will be Franklin Richards. Franklin? Hi, everyone. I have a, a little bit today, so I'll try to go a little fast to keep it under the two minutes. Uh, first of all, welcome back. Uh, while you were away, the council passed intro 2311, uh, a council member powers bill that empowers restaurants who use third party delivery application services such as Uber Eats, Grubhub, DoorDash, um, by providing them with access to their customers' basic information, name, telephone number, address, email, and order place. The bill allows the customer to choose if their data is shared, but if they do, this simple information about their customer will allow restaurants to make strategic business decisions and choices for their future. Council member powers believes the bill strikes the right balance between those that supply the platform and retain all the customer data and the restaurant who rely on them but should have access to their own customer's information. The bill became law on August 29th and will go into effect December 27th. In his role as chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, Councilmember Powers wrote a letter to Governor Hogel urging her to sign into law the Less Is More Act for which CM Powers passed a city council resolution in support of in 2019 and, and the bill has since passed both houses in Albany. The bill is an effort, effort to help address the ongoing crisis at Rikers Island and decrease the population by removing those who are only there on technical parole violation, such as missed curfews. Additionally, yesterday he convened an emergency interagency meeting about the crisis at Rikers, and his committee will be holding an oversight hearing on September 15th. Councilmember Powers, along with mayoral candidate Eric Adams and Councilmember Mark Levine, sponsored legislator calling upon Department of City Planning to remove outdated dancing restrictions that put unfair burdens on smaller bars, restaurants, um, and other businesses. The council member also passed legislation intro 1811 to help improve pedestrian experience and strengthen public safety measures in Times Square. Um, as folks have already said, Hurricane Ida has impacted many lives throughout the city. Ida left record rainfall flooding and will require us to reevaluate our current infrastructure. If the storm has impacted anyone, please feel free to contact our office at 212-818-0580. And um, two things quickly, um, CB5's uh, yeah. district. Sorry? No, I said go ahead very quickly. Yeah, very quickly, CB5 at district office and our office have been working with those um, that want to get POPs that are closed. Those are publicly operated, um, privately operated public spaces. Um, so if you file a 311 report, please uh, call our office or send it to me at F Riches at Council NYC. And we just want to say we look forward to hearing CB5's resolution on the Fifth Avenue uh, busway. Thank you so much, Vicky, and the rest of the board. Okay, thank you, Franklin. Um, that ends uh, that portion, and we now enter the public session uh, that I described earlier. Um, I do want you to know that this evening we have an unusually large number of registrants who want to speak 
uh, during the public session. So as most of you know, we have a two minute time limit uh, on those people who would like to address the board. And as we have always done at our in-person meetings, we have a 6.30 deadline to sign up to do so. So um, right now, we do have a lot of people who want to speak, but it would be late notice, so I'm not going to drop the time limit to one minute. We have done that in the past, but I won't do that tonight. But I do have a request. Um, my request is that you try not to repeat comments that have been made previously before your turn to speak, and that you be as brief as possible when stating your particular position that you would like the board to hear. You might be able to do that in less than two minutes, but make sure that we know what your position is. Should you need to take the full two minutes, we will, in the interest of time, be muting all comments at the end of the two minutes allotment. So we thank you for your understanding and for respecting this board's time, as we do have a very involved agenda this evening. I will now call the public who wish to speak regarding 415 Madison Avenue and matters other than the Fifth Avenue busway by raising the hand, by using the raise hand feature. I will then call and for anyone wishing to speak regarding the Fifth Avenue busway agenda item, and at that time, you will use the raise hand feature to be recognized. So who do we have waiting now? Let's see. Hold on. B. Friedman. Hey, uh, thank you for uh, the time to speak. Uh, I was going to speak about Fifth Avenue. Um, can you wait um, until, can you please wait until we have them all together? I'm looking for the- Absolutely, people. yeah. Okay, I would appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay, thank you. Jason, how about uh, Jason Schwabe? I know we have people that wanted to speak about 415. Are they on? Uh, hi, uh, I'm also here to speak about Fifth Avenue. Okay, you're on after this. And sure. how, how about Jane? Seden, S-E-I-D-E-N. I also want to speak about Fifth Avenue Busway. Hey, you guys aren't following directions very good tonight. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 that's I, okay. All right. We'll put you on with the next batch. Um, how about Roberto Robana? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi there. Well, I'm not speaking about that. I actually am representing FIT um, today. Okay. So let me just get technical issues. Anyway, um, good evening. My name is Roberto Robina uh, in place for my colleague, Lisa Wager at FIT. Um, first off, FIT reopened. Our first day of classes was last month, August 30th, and we are excited about the new semester. All students are fully vaccinated and faculty and staff are either vaccinated or tested weekly. Masks are required on campus and FIT is proud to be doing its part to keep, it, to keep our community safe and healthy. The museum at FIT also reopened uh, last month with the, with the debut of a major exhibition, Ravishing, The Rose in Fashion. This exhibition explores how the rose has influenced the way we look, dress, feel, and fantasize. Admission to the museum is free, and visitors are encouraged to plan ahead by reviewing the latest safety guidelines and protocols, all available online. And lastly, FIT was named the safest college in America. FIT in the heart of Chelsea was named number one in a survey this year of the safest college campuses in America by yourlocalsecurity.com website looked at campus, sec campus safety from hundreds of undergraduate institutions, crunching data from the U.S. Department of Education's Campus Safety and Security web website and the FBI's Uniform Crime Report. FB FIT's top position was thanks to its very low number of crimes, just one per 10,000 people. And that concludes my report with 22 seconds left uh, to go. Yes, so thank you very much. And congratulations on the Safe College. Thank you, thank you. Very nice. Thank you, okay, I think that we can move right now. I don't see, we did have 
two people interested in 415, but they have not joined us yet. So um, now we can go to anyone who is interested in speaking about the Fifth Avenue busway, starting with Paul Kohler. I'm Hi, sorry, it's, it's, it's Paul Crickler. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to applaud the DOT for the changes that they've laid before us at least twice, which is the extended sidewalk, the bike lane and the busway. I also love what I saw last meeting with the Transportation Committee, the Fifth Avenue Association vision of what Fifth Avenue could look like. I thought it was absolutely fabulous. And I see these two things going in necessary tandem, but we shouldn't wait for that vision to arrive because it will take three or four or five years plus. We need these big changes now. DOT has asked specifically, I think, about the busway, and I think that's what people are asking to talk about. My vote, my view would be to ask this community board to make it to ask for it to be made 24-7. There are thousands and thousands of workers who use this busway to get to work. They're not nine to five jobs or Monday to Friday jobs, and they're also very long journeys. So we should be doing everything we can to make lives easier, let alone safer because of all the car traffic reductions. I think New York City and CB5 have a dramatic opportunity to make a big statement here in making a, um, an amazing change, a dramatic change to the iconic Fifth Avenue. Along the way, improving the safety of transit for all and also improving the, the fairness and equity of transit for all. And then a long way to making it fabulous. So that's what I would support and ask you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm just going to repeat anyone who is interested in speaking about the Fifth Avenue busway, raise your hand now. And that takes us to the next person, which would be B. Friedman. Uh, hey, thanks for letting me speak. Uh, I just want to say I agree with uh, what Paul Crickler said. Um, I live and work in Midtown and I'm a huge supporter of the busway. Uh, bus lane blocking is rampant. Uh, so this is going to be a huge help to de decrease congestion and uh, allow the buses to uh, move freely without being blocked. 24-7 uh, is really important, so there's no confusion about when the bus hours are operating. This is going to be a huge help uh, for people like me who walk, bike, uh, and take uh, mass transit in um, the area, which, to be honest, is almost everybody. And it's going to be a huge draw for tourists, too. People want to go to a nice, safe place. It's great for walking. Uh, they don't want to go to a pseudo highway that's choked with cars and exhaust fumes. And it's just kind of like, you know, really ugly place. So uh, we have a great chance to uh, make Fifth Avenue um, a great place. So uh, thank you for this time to speak. Thank you. And thank you for the brevity. That's very nice. Appreciate it. We get it. Rosemary Wakeman. Hi, Rosemary, you can unmute. Oh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the board. Um, I as well agree that this new vision for Fifth Avenue is superb and I look forward to it. I would like to ask, however, that you stop the southbound traffic um, at West 57th as the last opportunity to make either a westbound or eastbound uh, movement. Um, right now, West 55th um, is the last um, opportunity and I would like the board to come to West 55th on Fifth Avenue and take a look at the congestion that exists there. West 55th is now a single lane road um, that is bordered by restaurant terraces and a bikeway. Um, any traffic turning west on Fifth Avenue onto West 55th is immediately confronted with the traffic in front of the Peninsula Hotel and the number of livery and taxis and um, delivery services that exist on this street. So the congestion on West 55th, and I ask you please to come and take a look yourselves, makes this an inopportune possibility for um, uh, leaving the traffic southbound. And instead I ask that you consider West 57th, West 57th as the last southbound possibility for traffic leaving Fifth Avenue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Jason Schwab. Schwab Schwabe? Schwalbe. Okay. Schwabe. Thank, thank, thank you very much for recognizing me. Okay. 
Um, okay, I live on 92nd Street and I work on 34th Street. My family, we own property in 34th and 36th and 5th Avenue. We have um, retail tenants who are suffering right now. Very honestly, there's too little traffic going down Fifth Avenue. So I love the idea of improving, of reducing congestion. But on the commercial corridor between 57th and 42nd Street, frankly, further south, you have two bus lanes. And I've noticed not much traffic. On 60s, it's, it's congested. And very honestly, I would wish that the DOT would consider this type of plan on Madison Avenue from 72nd Street to 92nd Street, where it's residential and congestion is really uh, anathema to residential life. But for commercial use, for tourists going to Saks Fifth Avenue or, 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 or going further down to Rock Center, right now we have to do everything possible to make it easy for them to get there. And so I would strongly encourage you not to pass this plan, but instead to look elsewhere in the city to ease congestion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. Robert Siegel. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'm assuming that the goal is to help the poor to middle-class workers of New York City and to help them and not to be naive about it, we must have people who pay taxes and bring in traffic from other countries. There are billions of taxes paid as a result of sales tax, real estate tax, and other taxes from the stores on Fifth Avenue of which there's now approximately a 35% vacancy rate. I've worked in this field for over 40 years, bringing these tenants to the, the avenue. And it is the best help for the poor and middle-class workers. The amount of unemployment, if more vacancies persist and Fifth Avenue is no longer a draw to the wealthy of the rest of the world, it will you will not have the taxes to pay for any of the buses uh, that provide the traffic. There are many other avenues for which people can get to work and from work, uh, but there is one avenue, Fifth Avenue, that draws the traffic, that pays all the benefits to the poor middle class. I think it is very naive to eliminate car traffic where, I'm not sure if the board is aware, but some people shop for over 100000 to a $1 million in a single visit to New York. These people result, rely on driving their cars to these shops. They do not travel in buses. And if the goal is to really help the poor, I think I want to go on record as eliminating car traffic will devastate the shopping and attracting the best shops of the world to Fifth Avenue and therefore the best consumers who pay the taxes that support our needs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, Lee Mannheim. Hello, thank you for recognizing me. Um, I'm going to uh, reiterate some of what was just said. I see, serve as the Senior Vice President of Coach uh, North America, and I'm also speaking to oppose the city's proposal to restrict traffic. Um, as others have said, the pandemic has been extremely painful for the retail and hospitality industry, and this proposal would just add further additional barriers for us to get customers to our store and consequently slow down our financial recovery um, which, you know, some others spoke about the taxes. We also employ many people who live in the city um, and the slower we recover, the less people we can employ. Um, so this isn't about simply opposing the transportation plan, but about rescuing a sector of our economy on which so many New Yorkers across the city rely on to survive. 
Um, as a New Yorker and a voice for a business on Fifth Avenue, I strongly urge the community board to listen to the businesses that keep Fifth Avenue lively. I hope the Department of Transportation will allow businesses to continue getting back on their feet amid the unprecedented pandemic that we sadly continue to endure. Thank you for offering me the time to speak today, and I hope this perspective is taken into consideration when voting on this proposal. Thank you, Lee. Okay, next up is Janet Liff. Hello, I, I, um, I actually work as a commercial real estate broker and uh, work with a lot of retail tenants and can tell you the first, the most, the, the most salient point is pedestrian traffic. That's what's critical. Uh, and also I would say, you know, in deference to DOT, I think some of the statements that I am for the plan, um, because I think DOT has done a really excellent job at accommodating the competing interest because the current plan allows 10 blocks of local traffic. So for the few people who actually, you know, these stores rely on one person a day to come in and drop that 150,000, it's not 20 customers, but for the, for the little bit of traffic that arrives to shop, this plan facilitates that. All it is, is getting rid of the people who want to start at 90th Street and wind up at 14th Street. So I think this plan is that DOT has done an excellent job on this final design. And at this particular time, we have to support sustainable transportation. We also have to think about space, that even if we had, you know, an electric cars that still, um, you need vastly more space to move 40 or 80 people in that many cars than you do a single bus. There's just this incredible inefficiency. So I think DOT's plan is excellent and it actually lays the great groundwork for the Fifth Avenue. If the bid wants to do more work, they'll be dealing with a streetscape that has a little bit less car traffic, which is a plus. And then I also support um, the 24 seven. I think that's just simpler and I don't see what, what what the upside is to making confusing hours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Janet. Next up is Melody Bryant. Hi, thank you so much for um, taking my comments. Um, I'd like to talk about the issues regarding global warming. It's no secret that New York City is being affected by it. And it's not just the coastal areas right now. People are dying. We lost somebody in my neighborhood. It, it was heartbreaking and it's going to get worse. So using our public space for driving at this point is insane. New York is one of the few places that I can actually do something about this. We have the most built out public transportation in the nation. We need to use it. That means efficient buses and the cheapest of all transportation systems, bikes. We also need wider sidewalks as tourists have been literally penned in during the holidays and can't even cross Fifth Avenue to get to the stores they came to patronize. So I strongly urge the board to vote yes on the DOT plan, which um, covers all of this and thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. David Warren. Hi, good evening, thank you for um your service to the community board. Um, just like I mentioned at the transportation committee meeting, um, I've traveled abroad many times and I don't travel in a private car because I don't know the, the cities. I don't even drive in. I treat the travel by bicycle or by public transportation. And I do a lot of shopping or I walk. So I, so if I'm a foreigner coming to a strange land, I'm not going to start driving on their streets. It's just doesn't make sense to me. So I support the 24 seven busway plan and the dot plan. Um, I also like to make a friendly amendment. If they're going to continue to have traffic go south of 57th Street, not to have 55th Street, the turn lane, but another odd block is a turn lane since it's a bicycle lane. So I, hopefully you can put that in as a friendly amendment to um, um, for the for the busway and the plan and the dot plan. Um, and I would just like to reiterate, thank you all for your service. Thank you very much, David. Next up, Jerome Barth. Thank you so much, Vicky. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. And thank you for the board for taking up this complicated issue. 
Uh, we are also grateful for the DOT's amendment to the original plan or in our involvement in, in the CAB meetings that have led to the amendments. Uh, in fact, one thing we'd like to propose, regardless of the way things go forward, is that those CAB meetings should continue and monitor any changes on Fifth Avenue. However, we would like to propose that the DOT pause their projects at this time. As some have said before, we are very much in the middle of a pandemic still. The Delta variant of COVID-19 has put New York's recovery on ice, to be honest. Things are uh, in a stasis right now, and many businesses are making decisions, as I, you've been hearing and you'll hear more, as to whether they want to keep forward planning for recovery or just uh, hold their cards closer to their chest and, and, and wait it out further until there's clear information about what's happening. And the DOT's plan at this particular moment in time, and so close to the holiday season, which is critical to these businesses and to the perception of New York and its attraction of, of visitors from out of town, is introducing uncertainty, it's introducing complexity, and it's not going to make it easier for our customers to access our businesses. This is not the right proposal at the right time. There is no imperative to act now, but speeds per the DOT's own communication is increasing on Fifth Avenue. Uh, so we, 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 this is, uh, as I've said before, a solution in search of a problem at this moment. We would rather we work our energies together on the, the long-term vision we're putting forward and we appreciate the community board's support of it. But please, please think about the, this moment in time and what's happening right now uh, and give us some time to breathe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome. Next up is Fred Cirillo. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and, and to the members of the board. Um, I, will, uh, <laughs> I will follow the instructions, knowing how long <clears throat> your agenda is and how many people signed up and not repeat, um, which is, would be difficult not to do. I will just say that I share, as you well know, you've heard me numerous times on this issue of the busway, uh, the the position that Jerome has just outlined, um, we feel exactly the same way and, and represent, uh, although different districts, uh, the similar business community um, and are very concerned about the timing of this, not the program in its entirety, but the manner in which this is proceeding. Uh, the restriction of traffic is really unnecessary as the two bus lanes already exist. Um, and we are very concerned in this period of recovery that and the holiday season approaching and what that means also for the core of this area, um, what impacts trying to squeeze this into the next month could have. So I share and we share the concerns of the Fifth Avenue Association and our other colleagues, but I do want to just end by thanking the board for their consideration of our request to pause this uh, hearing. We understand um, the concerns, but do appreciate your consideration and the consideration of EJ and his committee. Um, and we thank you. And um, as Jerome has already indicated, are quite supportive of the fact that the cab should continue. So as this issue continues, we will be able to weigh in, as will the community board, on any changes and updates and status of whatever DOT is going to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Um, the cab uh, mention is in the resolution. So, okay, we have next Francis Barker. Francis, you can unmute. Francis, we cannot hear you. Thank <clears throat> you. 
Okay, maybe we should go on to the next and I'll call Francis at the end and see if at that point they can get back on, okay? So next up, Dylan Kane. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great, uh, appreciate everyone's time. Um, I think there's a lot of really good ideas on both sides that have been presented. I hope to offer some, some concerns about the busway to hopefully uh, open minds. Um, I'm working in the commercial real estate industry myself. Uh, I focus on Fifth Avenue. I'm there every day. I also live on Lower Fifth Avenue as well. So uh, personally, do you take a frequent uh, commute home every day from Upper Fifth Ave down to Lower Fifth Ave and enjoy not having to take a bunch of turns? Um, I think most of my concern probably has to do with maybe some of the unintended negative consequences of this. I think there's obviously some good stuff to talk about on one side, but especially the timing right now, like I definitely prefer to take a cab, um, especially with the pandemic right now and generally avoid public transportation if I can, subways and buses. Um, if you do spend your time walking up and down Fifth Avenue every day, you'll notice that the buses are not full. There's always plenty of space. There's generally not many people at the stops. So it's not like there's some crazy over demand of uh, public transportation at the moment, it seems. Um, and I do think just with the timing of it all, and if you've ever gone down 7th Avenue, uh, especially during rush hour, it is a nightmare. And having to redirect all the 5th Avenue, car traffic, 7th or park, um, just seems like it could be a really, really messy situation and really be problematic for a lot of commutes, um, obviously mine included. Uh, but yeah, it just seems like it would be much smarter just talking to tenants and seeing other perspectives to maybe just wait, wait this out a little bit with the pandemic. Fifth Avenue is coming back, but it's still very fragile. So perhaps waiting until calmer waters in 2022 to, to rethink this through in the best way possible uh, might be the most prudent path forward. Thank you very much. Okay, next up will be Daniel Cuthbart. Daniel Cuthbart. Hi, Daniel, you can unmute. Daniel, shall we move on, Luke? Or does it look like he's coming through? Doesn't look like he's coming through. Okay, moving on, I'll go back to him at the end. Um, Andrew Rosenthal. Good evening and thank you for allowing the public to speak. I worked in CB5 for 30 years in financial services at many major investment banks. I'm very familiar with all of the avenues uh, in your district, and I fully support this plan. I want to take counter two of the comments that I've heard earlier tonight from the public. Uh, one is asking for delay. We can't afford to delay this. Uh, I'm looking at the crash statistics for CB5. There have been 34 people in the last 10 years killed in automobile crashes. There have been 8,479 people seriously injured. That's a life altering injury. And doing nothing or delaying is not an option. We need to do something and we need to do it now. The second point I'd like to make is businesses often don't know what's best for them. Mayor Giuliani almost tore down the high line because real estate developers thought it was impeding them. Look what we have now. Similarly, Times Square, there was a lot of resistance to redesigning Times Square and look at the rents and the occupancy rates in Times Square. So mm. please, please pass this tonight and let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Next up will be Jane 
Poseidon. Yes, Jane Selden. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm a resident of Lower Manhattan and a climate activist with um, the environmental group 350 NYC. Last week, with the devastation caused by Hurricane Ida, our city was jolted into another reminder that the climate crisis has arrived. We have a short window of opportunity to drastically lower greenhouse emissions in order to avert um, uh, frequent and more cataclysmic climate events in the future. The transportation sector plays a key role because it contributes 30% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions with private vehicles being the largest contributors. To transition away from car-centric streets, we need to incentivize walking, public transportation, cycling, and discourage private vehicles. And, and does the current um, scaled back DOT plan for Fifth Avenue go far enough to achieve these objectives? I don't think so. The original plan was for the busway to go from 34th Street to 57th and for it to be 24 seven. Now it only goes to 42nd Street and is no longer 24 seven. Essential workers like hospital and transportation workers who commute by bus work around the clock, not just nine to five. Now the Fifth Avenue Business Association presented a stunning vision um, for Fifth Avenue to be a tree-lined corridor with wide sidewalks and bike lanes. But this group says this is a vision for the future, not now. But we're running out of time. We can't wait for the future. We need to re-envision our streetscape now. We need to draw down greenhouse gas emissions from private vehicles now. <clears throat> and we need to put in green infrastructure. The greener our public spaces, the better they can mitigate the flooding that is part of our new reality. So I would urge Community Board 5 to reject this compromised version of the Fifth Avenue Square. Okay, I think I'll let her finish what she's urging because we did not hear that. Is she still on? Okay, Jane, you can unmute yourself to finish. Uh, I guess I, uh, just, finish I just, a take... just finish your sentence, Jane. Okay, I would urge Community Board 5 to reject this compromised version of Fifth Avenue busway and approve the original plan. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, that brings us to uh, Frances Barker. Is Frances able to join us now? Frances, you can unmute. It does not appear okay. that. Okay, how about Daniel Cuthbart? Hello, can you hear me? Is that Daniel? Yes. Yes, yes. So quickly, I live on 55th Street. I see the uh, private vehicles on my street every day. It's gotten worse, but I, so I fully support the 24 seven hour busway. Keeping Fifth Avenue in the past is not gonna help any businesses in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Is there anyone else who may have uh, an item that's not within uh, this category that was not able to speak in the beginning? I see a hand raised by a phone number ending in 862. Okay. Okay, 862, you can press star six to unmute yourself. It appears that there might be some technical okay. issues. All right, uh, then actually <clears throat> uh, that will close the public session. Um, a, a number of people who uh, planned on joining the board meeting this evening from the public uh, obviously did not. But I do wanna say how much we appreciate those who spoke who really were mindful of our time and um, we do appreciate it. I just want everyone to know that. So thank you very much. Okay, we now move into our business session um, where I mentioned that this is where board members are only are allowed to speak. So um, 
I always ask that since this is a virtual meeting, uh, please try to have your videos on during the meeting. And a reminder again regarding the chat feature that in keeping with our mandate to adhere to the open meetings law, any remarks about our business or questions about the agenda topics should be made on the record by raising your hand through the raise hand feature. The chat is to be used only to alert us to any technical difficulties or operational questions or information like an email address or a link that has already been stated on the record during the meeting. So we are now entering the business session and I'd like a motion to accept the July minutes. I move. I'll move. Thank and a you. second. Second. Okay, thank you so much. And we will have our roll call vote. Michaelis. Yes. Athenale. <clears throat> yes. Behar. Back. Behar. Come back to him. Um, Brosnahan. Yes. Chu. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Kayhang. Sorry, Kathy, I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong. I apologize. Hey, yes. Kong, like King Kong. Kong. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Lagasico. Yes. Levy is a yes. I noted it. Leone. Yes. Livese. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Miller. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Thigman. Yes. Slutskin is a yes. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Fence. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Sung. <clears throat> I think she must have knocked off. Uh, Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Sure, I thought she's here. Yang. Yes. Uh, Behar. And I'll ask uh, Sung is not on. Okay, motion passes. Okay, the minutes are accepted. Um, I would like to just mention something that you, you may already know part of, but, uh, um, and it has been mentioned earlier that on September 1st, Governor Kathy Hochul suspended compliance with the in-person requirement of the open meetings law and allowed us virtual or hybrid meetings until Saturday, January 15th of 2022. So for 15 months, as you know, community boards conducted virtual public meetings to a really a, a, a fabulous success. The ability to join remotely, whether online or by phone, has allowed board members to perform their duties safely and has increased engagement from the public many of whom were previously unable to attend in-person meetings due to their schedule, uh, personal commitments, or just be, by being um, not ambulatory. Every Manhattan Community Board has described an increase in attendance from not only members, but members of the public attending virtual meetings. Since we are required to go back to in-person meetings in January, the community boards are continuing to contact our state officials and the governor to pass legislation that amends the open meetings law to allow virtual and hybrid meetings permanently. So um, I'd just like to say that if you agree, I encourage you and members of the public to do the same and contact your elected officials with this request to amend the open meetings law. Thank you so much. And now we will proceed to our ratification of the emergency action by the executive committee on the Moschino fashion event in Bryant Park, which I believe is going either went on this afternoon or it's going on right now. So 
Uh, the, at this point, we're asking you to ratify um, at the regular meeting of the Parks and Public Spaces Committee of the board, um, the committee discussed and unanimously passed a resolution to approve this event in Bryant Park. And the deadline was prior to tonight's full board meeting. So according to our bylaws in emergency situations, CB5's exec committee may act on behalf of the board providing any such action shall be ratified or make the action official by the board membership at the next regular monthly meeting, which is what we're at right now. Basically ratification is the validation or confirmation of a previous action taken by a similar group or committee of an organization. So the exec committee unanimously approved the parks and public space committee's resolution on behalf of the board in order to meet that deadline. So may I have a motion to ratify the approved resolution? Motion to approve. And a second, please. Second. Okay, thank you. And we will vote on this right now. Okay. Akalis. Yes. Athenale. Yes. Um, Behar. Always listed on. Uh, Brosnahan. Yes. Chu. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Kong. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Lagosico. Yes. Uh, Levy. Z yes. Uh, Leone. Yes. Livese. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Miller. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. Slutskin is a yes. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Spence. Yes. Stern. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Passes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, before we get into our committee reports. Um, I would like to introduce uh, a new member of our board, just came on board, I think last week. Samir, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce your last name. Uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself, tell us why you want to join Community Board 5, um, just a little bit about yourself before we go into our committee reports. So Samir, yeah, I don't so know how to pronounce your last name. Yeah, it's pronounced Lavingia. So, Lavingia, okay. So I'm, I'm Samir Lavingia. Um, yeah, I've so I've been in New York. I moved here about two and a half years ago. I've been super involved in local politics. I'm sure you've seen me around at CB5 meetings before I was put on the board um, by recommendation of Council Member Rivera. Um, and I just think it's a very, like community boards are a very awesome way to like have an impact on like the very early stages of all these projects before they actually happen. And I've seen that from the outside and I really wanted to take part and, and help on the inside. Uh, so that's why that what, that's what motivated me to apply and eventually be appointed to the community board. And I'm really looking forward to uh, working with all of you. Um, and the committees I'm on specifically are, um, I believe it's public safety and quality of life and then parks and public spaces. And I'm super excited to be on both of those. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome aboard and it's great to have you. And yes, those are your two committees. They're looking forward to your participation for the October cycle. So good to see you. Uh, okay, that now takes us into the committee reports. Um, we will start with land use, housing and zoning. Layla. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, this month we had one application. This is a uh, ULR uh, application for a uh, building at 415 Madison Avenue. This is the um, corner of Madison and 48th Street. 
and uh, the applicant is the uh, rooting management uh, company. Uh, they have uh, owned the building. There is an existing building currently, and uh, they are proposing to actually tear down the building and uh, rebuild a new building under the uh, East Midtown uh, new zoning that was passed and enacted in uh, 2018. Um, they, in order for this uh, building to go up, they have to uh, basically seek four actions from uh, the City Planning Commission. Two actions are certifications, which means that they're not non-discretionary. Uh, the first one is uh, the building currently is uh, overbuilt. The building was built in 1955 before um, the new uh, zoning resolution of 1961 was enacted. And it was built to a density that would not have been permitted uh, under the uh, 1961 uh, new zoning resolution. Um, they actually wish to keep this uh, overbuilt uh, density. There is a provision in the East Midtown uh, new zoning subdistrict that basically allows for that to happen, provided that they pay into a, uh, a fund, the uh, public realm, the East Midtown public realm fund, and they're doing that uh, in a proportion that is uh, commensurate with the density that they're uh, retaining. The second certification that they're seeking is actually for the transfer of development rights from St. Bartholomew Church, which is an individual landmark, and they are uh, purchasing air rights. Um, it, actually, the transaction is complicated, but they will basically incorporate uh, available uh, unused air rights from St. Bartholomew into their project. That also requires a certification. It is non-discretionary, meaning that you know if it fits all the parameters and the criteria, then uh, the certification will be issued. So we reviewed those two and we had no problem with those. Um, they are asking two special permits in addition to uh, these certifications in order for this uh, building to, uh, to happen. Um, the first one is that they're asking for a, a bonus density, a bonus FAR. FAR stands for uh, floor area ratio. Um, and uh, the reason they're seeking this bonus is actually in exchange for uh, building a public concourse. The public concourse is going to be located uh, at the at the base of the building, uh, at the um, uh, so that would be the mm, southwest corner of the building, which the building itself would be located on the northeast corner of, of the block. So basically, it's it's you know the 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 uh, the, the entrance the, the you know facing those two sidewalks would basically be turned into a, uh, a public concourse. The reason why uh, this particular concourse is really exciting and uh, a, a robust contribution to the public realm is that in addition to this concourse, but separate from this application, um, the MTA is, um, has negotiated an easement uh, in the building, providing access to uh, inside access. Um, so there's going to be an entrance it, within the building footprint, uh, allowing for uh, passengers and users to basically access the northernmost portion of uh, Eastside uh, access uh, platforms. Um, this concourse for which they're seeking the bonus uh, that is going to be at grade would basically flank this entrance, allowing for uh, additional entrances. Uh, there's going to be entrances on 48th Street, but then now there would be also entrances to the east side access uh, uh, entrance through this concourse. And uh, there's also going to be uh, seeding and planting. Um, the, the committee reviewed carefully the, uh, the, the design and the way the, the concourse is going to operate. And uh, we found that it was really done uh, very smartly with uh, users in mind, and it's going to be a, a real tangible benefit. Um, the final action for which they are seeking a special permit is that uh, for a number of reasons, including for the fact that they are building this, uh, this concourse, which we see as a public benefit, um, they are seeking uh, relief from uh, uh, like a waiver from uh, the, uh, the height and setback, as well as the, uh, the, the uh, retail uh, continuity along Madison Avenue. So um, in the provision of the text, any new building on Madison Avenue must have retail. 
and uh, the, the the rationale being that you know Madison Avenue is is a retail corridor, um, and uh, it is important to preserve it as such. Um, in that particular case. They are building the concourse, therefore they are disrupting this continuity, but we see this trade-off as being beneficial and in favor of uh, the public, the users, pedestrians, the transit users of uh, uh, Eastside Access and, uh, and Grand Central. Um, they are uh, also asking for relief on the, uh, the bulk and height. The building technically does not pass the, uh, the daylight evaluation for some sort of an odd reason. And we also put this in the context of the fact that immediately adjacent to the south of the building, uh, the JP Morgan headquarters uh, is in the process of being erected. It seemed to be a very dense building um, that is going to actually uh, probably impact the, the delight evaluation score of, of this building. Meaning that you know this new building that we're reviewing tonight um, is going to have much less of, of a negative impact because actually some of the daylight will already be taken away by uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, which is you know a project that we reviewed, uh, you know which we had uh, grave concerns uh, about and for which we actually gained uh, so some you know substantial changes. Nonetheless, you know it, it's going to be a very dense building. And and it is happening. It is uh, in you know in the process of uh, of being constructed. So, for all these reasons, the committee felt that you know it was a good proposal. If anything, you know I I would say that this is the first proposal in East Midtown that a is actually uh, on a site that was uh, evaluated when the rezoning was contemplated. All the other sites um, were actually not evaluated by the Department of uh, of uh, City Planning. Um, and it really accomplishes what the, 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 the concept of this rezoning was. There's a little bit of public realm improvement. There's a little bit of uh, historic uh, uh, preservation through the transfer of air rights. Um, there's a little bit of transit with the uh, east side access uh, entrance, although it's not part of this application. But basically, it's, it's a good mix of you know, all these tools that are in the toolbox. And it really makes the point that one doesn't have to work against the other. We can actually preserve landmarks, uh, increase density, uh, modernize our office stock, and uh, provides for uh, some good public benefits. So all of that long explanation uh, to say that the committee voted to uh, recommend approval of this proposal, of this application. Okay, thank you, Layla. Uh, does anyone have a conflict with this application? If so, please raise your hand. Okay. Are there any questions to the resolution? Any comments? I don't see any, which means. Clayton has a comment. Oh, Clayton. Thank you so much. I just wanna reiterate, um, Layla does such a great job of summing that up, but anyone who's interested in these issues who is not on the committee, including members of the public, I would encourage you to go to the YouTube channel and watch the recording of this meeting because this application was extremely unusual that it does what Layla illustrated, which is balance the needs of the public and private sectors in a way that the zoning was intended to do. And I think it's particularly important given what we are facing now with the Penn Station area and with the proposed Empire Station complex or whatever it's called, um, to really think about how an appropriate balance does look in a way that does serve the public benefit and also gives the developers their projects. So I just wanted to back up what Leila just said and encourage anyone who's interested to watch the recording of that meeting to see the details of this proposal in more detail. And the recording, you're saying the recording of the committee meeting, right? Right. Yeah, wonderful idea. Thank you, Clayton. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no other comments, we will take this to a vote. Okay. Go on reverse. Approve. 
Oh, sorry. Thank you, David. <laughs> yes, they have a motion to approve. Motion David. to approve. Okay, and a second. Second. Okay. And Yang. Sorry, Yang. Yes. Waylon. Yes. Webb. Yes. Stern. Yes. Spence. Yes. Bandorf. Yes. Smith. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Sigmund. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Uh, Miller. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Livese. Yes. Leone. Yes. Levy is a yes. Uh, Logosico. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Kong. Yes. Hayback. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Harris. Yes. Haas. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Uh, Diggins. Yes. Chu. Yes. Brosnahan. Yes. Uh, Behar. Still local. Yes. Okay. Uh, Athenale. Yes. Michaelis. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you so much. Moving on to transportation and environment, EJ. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, T&E had two resolutions this month. Um, I'd like to have them deemed read. So deemed. And uh, I'd like to bundle. Okay. Uh, our first resolution um, was in response to a proposal from DOT on uh, some proposed traffic restrictions to increase bus speeds on Fifth Avenue. Um, for background, uh, DOT implemented um, a reconfiguration of Fifth Avenue this summer with the installation of a protected bike lane and reduction of a travel lane. Uh, DOT maintains a community advisory board or CAB uh, related to Fifth Avenue, which includes Community Board 5, local bids, uh, local retailers and residents. Um, DOT had presented the lane reconfiguration to the cab and after that went ahead and implemented the, the um, street reconfiguration. Following those changes, um, they next uh, started coming to the cab with a plan to implement turning rules on the avenue uh, to create a, um, a busway for improved bus speeds along the lines of what had been done on 14th Street. Over the course of a series of, of CAB meetings, they presented their plan and received a considerable amount of um, uh, feedback and criticism and concern from community members, retailers, and bids on Fifth Avenue. Um, over the course of these discussions and uh, in response to, to these concerns, DOT subsequently scaled down the proposal, um, reducing it from a full busway where cars would have to uh, turn off the street at every block, like on 14th Street right now, um, down to a proposal uh, for an avenue with two specific turn off uh, points where cars uh, would have to take a right turn off the avenue, one at 55th Street and one at 45th Street. So in this scaled down proposal, um, cars would turn off uh, when reaching one of these two points, but um, all cars will continue to be able to turn onto the avenue um, and access Fifth Avenue uh, wherever they want at every block, um, basically as usual. And, and cars can still travel the full length of Fifth Avenue above, below, and, and between those two points for the, for the 10 blocks in between. There will also continue to be three intersections with restricted right turns, which are actually existing holiday restrictions um, uh, uh, holiday season restrictions meant to um, protect, protect, protect pedestrians. Those already exist uh, during the holiday season. So anyway, after these CAB meetings, DOT um, presented this scaled down proposal to the Transportation Environment Committee this month. Uh, the committee felt that the scaled back proposal with these two turnoff points was you know, much more modest than the original proposal as a result of DOT responding to and incorporating a lot of that community concern 
um, and would have much lower impact than, than, you know, even what we see on 14th street right now. Uh, we also felt that its goals are pretty much in line with DOT's other efforts uh, in the district to reduce congestion and increase bus speeds and to reduce accidents as part of uh, Vision Zero. We, um, you know, obviously heard a lot uh, uh, from members of the public, both on the night of the committee meeting and tonight, um, some who felt that the plan goes too far at the wrong time and some who felt that the plan doesn't go far enough and is, and is very urgently needed and more is urgently needed. Uh, the committee really ultimately felt that the, the scaled back DOT plan was, a, was frankly a good compromise and um, addressed a lot of the concerns of the community, but, but still took action to um, improve safety and, um, and bus speeds and vision zero goals. We, we did, however, definitely agree and demand that um, DOT continue the cab, uh, should absolutely continue meeting with the community through the cab um, as this plan gets, uh, gets implemented so the community can weigh in on all the effects and implications. Uh, the committee also heard a presentation in response to DOT's proposal from the Fifth Avenue Association, um, a, a, a business improvement district um, that represents uh, Fifth Avenue retailers. The association said that they disagreed with DOT's focus on short-term traffic rules. And what they presented to us instead um, laid out a multi-year capital plan to improve uh, Fifth Avenue, to improve the corridor, the Fifth Avenue corridor permanently with um, expanded sidewalks, more greenery and plantings to create a, a corridor of green pedestrian space, you know, all the way from Central Park down to Bryant Park, a, a reconfigured narrower avenue between these expanded pedestrian sidewalks with, with fewer traffic lanes, narrower crossings to create um, safer crosswalks, a protected bike lane and, um, and dedicated bus lanes. Uh, it, was, it was a very impressive proposal um, that the Fifth Avenue Association actually commissioned from Sam Schwartz Engineering. Uh, the committee, frankly, frankly loved this vision for the future of Fifth Avenue um, that the association uh, provided. Pretty much all the members of the committee thought it was beautiful and compelling and, and really well thought out. Uh, and it actually appeared to us to align really nicely with the, um, uh, uh, with the lane reconfiguration that DOT already implemented this summer. Um, so I, all the members of the committee agreed that this was like an ambitious and worthy plan for the future of uh, Fifth Avenue um, to, to, to make permanent and beautify, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, a lot of the changes that have already taken place um, and to, and to kind of, you know, truly create a, a beautiful competitive Avenue kind of on par with, um, with, with other, other boulevards and other cities, um, global cities. Uh, in our resolution, we wanted to make sure to say that we not only kind of approved of this vision, but uh, that, we're, that Community Board 5 was also committed to helping to work with the Fifth Avenue Association and the community to, to make it happen. The committee spent a lot of time in what was a really long committee meeting. Um, uh, hearing from everyone on the public who wanted to speak on both proposals, the, the scaled down DOT turning rules, and um, this capital plan vision by the Fifth Avenue Association. And we tried to evaluate whether or not these, these two proposals were in any way at odds with each other. And we ultimately couldn't find any contradiction between the two of them. Um, we, 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 the committee agreed that the city can implement these turning rules now and still absolutely pursue this kind of like fabulous capital plan and more permanent refurbishment of Fifth Avenue uh, over the next one to two to three years. Um, and DOT actually indicated that they were very open and receptive to this, to the Fifth Avenue Association's vision and, um, uh, and the capital improvement plan, which, which was is pretty exciting. Uh, t &E ultimately passed a resolution that both okay, the turning restrictions in the short term, the, the kind of compromise scaled down plan and strongly supported the Fifth Avenue Association's vision for the future of um, Fifth Avenue. Uh, you know, we wanted to, as I said, we wanted to indicate that we not only supported the Fifth Avenue Association's vision, but we also wanted to help make it a reality by facilitating the necessary funding and community engagement, liaising with the city, et cetera. Uh, we, we called on DOT to work with the Fifth Avenue Association to move that vision forward, to, to continue to further develop the plan, 
um, and uh, and to to make the capital project a reality. Um, so we uh, we're really supportive of kind of the the ambition uh, of kind of the the plan for the future of fifth avenue we reconciled those two positions are actually really closely aligned with each other and the committee um uh voted unanimously on the resolution uh 13 to 0 after uh, assessing both pieces okay thank you very much ej um does anyone have a conflict with this application resolution Okay, are there any questions to the resolution? Mike. Yeah, on line uh, 150, could we possibly change that to read um, New York Public Library or 42nd Street? Because Bryant Park is kind of on 6th Avenue and the library is on 5th Avenue. Absolutely, that feels like a friendly amendment. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Any comments? Mary? Yeah, I just wanna thank EJ and everyone on the committee for, it sounds like a, a ton of work. Um, I just wanted to point out lines 126 through 130. Um, it talks about uh, that, there, that any concerns about these types of expansions are not borne out by any data or evidence since implementation. And I just have to reiterate that the only way that these type of statements can be made is that DOT has not made good on its past promises to provide the data that we need to examine whether 14th Street has impacted local traffic, for instance. And by including this language, we're just further enabling and reinforcing the bad behavior by DOT. I think one of our main jobs as a community board is to hold public agencies' feet to the fire, but we can't do that if we're not getting the data that's been promised. And, you know, Sam Schwartz has made a sort of cottage industry out of backing up the DOT plans on this regard and is not following through on DOT's promises to get us the data. So at a minimum, I would hope that we could remove the clause that says particularly along 14th Street, but I, I really have a problem with um, lines 126 to 130. Thanks. Um, Mary, do you have a suggestion or an amendment? How uh, you know, in best world, I would I would like lines one twenty six to one thirty removed, but at a minimum, please remove particularly Fourteenth Street, because you know, even before I joined uh, this community board, uh, promises were made, and here we are years later, promises not kept in terms of data provided. Vicky, could I respond for for just sure. a second? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Mary's 100% correct. This is, this is a, a very long-standing problem that we have with DOT. Um, it's something that we have been trying very hard to get them to respond to. Um, it's been a multi-month, multi-year effort. And um, we actually have a current uh, uh, agreement slash plan with DOT to get them to come to our next committee meeting with a data-driven report on a series of past projects that they promised to come back to us about and never did. Um, and, and we're hoping to get kind of comprehensive information about multiple projects uh, during our next um, committee meeting. So I, I just wanna point out like the, the, the concern is well taken um, we have been, uh, folks on the, folk, a small team on the committee has been diligently trying to address it with DOT, and we're very optimistic that we are getting an, a report along those lines um, next month. As far as addressing your concerns about this language here, um, I, I think we were, this language was probably crafted more specific to, um, to the more, 
<laughs> the data that we have as a community board in terms of complaint and um, and anecdotal report that we get from community members um, to the board office. Uh, that having been said, if it's if it's not specific enough or rather too specific, um, you know, I, I would be pretty comfortable at least removing the, um, the particularly along 14th Street. Mary. Yeah, well, since there's planning on attending our next meeting, I would again just say in the best world, I think that we should remove lines 126 to 130 just to let them know that we're serious. Okay. And EJ, you're, you're saying that we're okay with that. I would be okay with it, yeah. All right. Does anyone else have any problem with removing lines 126 through 130? Uh, we could do it officially as an amendment if we do have controversy, but if not, um, does anyone want to comment or, you know, against removing it? I don't see anyone, so I will take that as a, it's considered a friendly amendment if, if everyone is in favor of it and it just doesn't change the ultimate intent of the result that came out of the resolution. So thank you both. Um, all right, is, uh, does anyone else have a comment? David. Yes, thank you, Vicki. I will be voting against this resolution, partially for the reasons that Mary said. I think there's a lot the Department of Transportation could have already done to solve some of these problems with congestion and safety, which they have not approached yet. And I'm also very concerned that 55th Street, if they were familiar with the neighborhood and the proposal is just not the place for a turnoff for reasons people mentioned earlier. And lastly, I'm also concerned that once the Department of Transportation does something, there is no going back from that change. So for those reasons, I will be voting against this resolution. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Layla. Uh, yes, I, I'm actually really torn about this uh, this resolution. Um, I'm not sure I actually understand the goal and uh, the problem that DOT is trying to solve. Um, if it is a safety issue, um, I think that it's fair to say that buses cause a number of accidents in uh, in New York City, and uh, they are vehicles. Uh, you know, they're not automobiles, but they're vehicles and uh, collisions between uh, those vehicles and uh, pedestrians or cyclists do happen. I don't have the statistics, but I think that, you know, DOT probably does. And uh, uh, to Mary's point, you know, it would be good that they would uh, share this, this data. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the, the fleet of buses is not electric. So these buses contribute to pollution. So what are we trying to solve exactly? Just, you know, get, getting the traffic to move faster faster, uh, uh, allowing for a, a safer environment. Um, honestly, as a pedestrian on Fifth Avenue or on Madison Avenue, uh, having these uh, express buses going uh, up and down, um, it actually creates an uh, uncomfortable uh, uh, condition for, for pedestrians on sidewalk. So I, I don't find them to be increasing safety. I understand that they're very important and you know, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have buses, but I, I'm just failing to see what is the vision here. And I find that the, uh, the, the proposal that the Fifth Avenue Association presented at the, uh, the committee is uh, a, a much more uh, all encompassing uh, comprehensive proposal that I think we should uh, put our weight behind. Um, and I'm not convinced that the, the, the approach that DOD is, uh, is choosing right now is, is really make, makes sense. Uh, you know, maybe I'm missing the point, but uh, I don't see what problems uh, we're solving uh, with, uh, with this uh, uh, proposal by DOT. Okay, does anyone else have any comments? Vicki, I can, I'll, I'll just add one thing if I can in sure. response to, to Layla's comment. Um, you know, I mentioned a little bit the context of how DOT broke up its plans for, for Fifth Avenue into two pieces, essentially, that, that were implemented in two phases. They first implemented 
lane changes this summer and and they're now implementing these turning restrictions and we have a lot of problems with dot in particular the way that they end up doing things in this piecemeal sort of way and not in a comprehensive street plan sort of way um that being said the way they broke it up um the at least from 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 dot's telling the stated intention of the lane reconfiguration that happened this summer was safety. And that was intended to, to address safety concerns by reducing travel lanes, creating, you know, um, a protected uh, uh, bike lane um, and, and, you know, uh, further isolating uh, ex an expanded sidewalk of pedestrians and bike lanes from, from traffic. The stated, in, the stated goal of this most late, uh, most recent phase that were, uh, uh, that was presented to us this month was, was bus speed, essentially. Okay, thank you, Lee Jay. Um, are there any other comments? David, your hand is still up, is that? Uh, okay, and Layla. Okay. Anyone else? Any other comments? Just a minute while I check. Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to the next resolution. The second resolution to come out of uh, TNE this month um, was another presentation that we heard from DOT. This was a proposal to make um, more permanent some improvements that DOT had made previously to Lexington Avenue between 41st and 51st Street streets. Uh, they had um, in in the past uh, one to two years expanded sidewalks. Um, and, and reconfigured the street somewhat, uh, those particular blocks using light materials like, like paint and collapsible dividers as they often do to try out a new um, treatment. Uh, DOT uh, uh, came back to report uh, that they had discovered in the aftermath compliance with this new um, street geometry has not been what they hoped for. Uh, the sidewalk extensions are getting used for parking uh, the, the bus lanes uh, are not obvious and are getting used by other vehicles. Um, and just generally, uh, they're not seeing the results that they were hoping for. Uh, the, the improvements that DOT presented to us that are proposed are meant to, to improve all of that, um, including painting the bus lanes red, uh, new curb extensions to make crossings shorter, um, uh, uh, reducing, reducing, um, uh, lane on the west side of the street and consolidating uh, some bus stops that that were only a block apart from each other, as well as installing more permanent dividers to um, discourage parking in uh, areas that are that are clearly intended for pedestrians. Um, to the committee's uh, uh, eye, these all seemed like positive improvements and clarification of the previously implemented changes to Lexington. Um, we asked, as we always do, DOT to come back this winter. Um, you know, whether things are going great or whether they're going bad to report on how things are going after implementation. Uh, we, will, we will be diligent to try and hold them to that. Um, but we had no problem with, with these proposals and we also approved this unanimously 13 to zero. Okay, thank you, Lee Jay. Uh, does anyone have a conflict with this application? Does anyone have any questions to the resolution? Are there any comments? Okay. I, actually, Vicky, if I can just make a very brief comment. Yes, who is that? Oh, Layla? Where Layla. Yeah, okay, Layla. go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the, the results are bundled. I'm not going to ask to, um, to unbundle. And in the spirit of collegiality, I will vote uh, in favor in support of the, uh, the work of the, uh, of the committee. Although I do have concerns with, uh, with one uh, result as I stated. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no comments. I think we can take both of these resolutions to a vote. Okay. 
And just as a reminder, committee members, you do not have to vote yes on both or no on both. You can do yes on one, no on the other. Just let me know if that's the case. But you don't have to do it just because they're bundled doesn't mean you have to vote the same way for both. Uh, Akalis. No on the bus lane, yes on Lexington. Athenale. Yes. Behar. Yes. Rosnahan. No on the bus lane, yes on the second. Two. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. No on the first, just on the second. Higher. No on the first, yes on the second. Johnson. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Uh, Kong. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Uh, Lagasico. Yes. Levy is a yes on both. Leone. Yes. Livese. Yes. Mafia. I don't know if he's still on. I know he's dropping off. Um, Miller. Oh, yeah, Miller. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. I'm a yes on both. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Spence. Yes. Stern. Yes on both. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Motion pass. Okay. They both passed. Thank you very much. That moves us on to the Landmarks Committee, Layla. Okay, so we had four uh, applications for resolutions this month. Uh, I would like to have them Dean read. So deemed. And uh, okay, it was a long meeting. I'm going to try to do a quick presentation. Uh, the first one, uh, 30 Rock. Uh, they're proposing uh, alterations at four uh, different areas. On the ground floor, they want to replace storefronts into doors. Um, this is to actually facilitate the uh, entrance to the uh, top of the rock observation deck. And um, they basically want to create a new entrance for uh, this uh, attraction. On the mezzanine level, uh, it's an interior landmark. They're proposing some alterations that are fairly modest. Um, the, the, the mezzanine is not uh, very often visited. And uh, they're basically opening up a wall uh, also to facilitate uh, the uh, uh, people moving um, uh, as they access the top of the rock. Um, actually, before I continue, I think someone has their uh, mic on if, uh, and it's causing an echo. Uh, if you can put yourselves on mute, that would be much appreciated. Thank you so much. Um, okay, moving up, um, uh, the next alteration is on the 69th floor. Um, this is the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the viewing platform. It's not top of the rock, but it is the, uh, the uh, a, uh, observation area. So what they're proposing to do there is, you're probably very familiar with uh, the uh, iconic photograph uh, lunch atop a skyscraper. Uh, where you have these uh, construction workers uh, casually sitting on a beam and uh, eating their lunch. They want to recreate uh, this experience by installing uh, short sections that look like beams on which uh, people, visitors, uh, would be able to sit and there would be a backrest and they would be strapped uh, in a uh, safe way. And then this beam would lift up uh, with a sort of like piston system and uh, people would be sitting, you know, a few feet off of the, uh, the, the floor and their photo would be taken and the beam could actually rotate and they would enjoy a 360 view of, uh, of the city and then the beam would come back down. 
uh, in terms, we, we don't comment on news and therefore we refrain from uh, deciding whether it was fabulous, exciting, uh, tacky, or you know, any of those considerations. We really only looked at the impact that it would have on the hardscape, like the, the physical uh, experience of the landmark itself. Uh, basically, the, the alterations are very, very modest and uh, it is not visible from, uh, from the street and uh, we felt it was appropriate. Going up uh, one more uh, story, then we are on top of the rock. Um, the applicant is proposing a number of changes up there. They want to install a beacon. Um, historically, there was actually a, a beacon at times on the, uh, on the observation deck. It was actually always an observation deck. It was constructed uh, in the 30s uh, for the top of the, uh, the building to be an observation uh, area for, uh, for visitors. And there was uh, a beacon, there was uh, lighting at different times in, in history. So we felt that installing this beacon, which is going to be a globe that takes its uh, design cues from a number of uh, artistic renditions that exist currently in, in the building, uh, Atlas being uh, the, the, the main inspiration for, for this, uh, this beacon, um, you know, is something that is historically appropriate. And we had no problem with that. They are proposing to redo the flooring and they're going to install uh, mosaic tiles um, in a uh, really whimsical uh, celestial uh, themed uh, design. And uh, we felt that you know, the choice of material uh, was also uh, appropriate. They're also proposing to build a, an additional viewing platform on top of the observation deck. So, and they're going to call it top of the top um, and uh, this viewing platform is uh, sort of like on, on a pedestal and then it sort of like flares up and there's a, a large uh, metal uh, platform that sits on, on this uh, pedestal. Um, the design of uh, this uh, proposed uh, uh, platform uh, is actually very heavy and very modern, which is kind of odd because usually modern is, is you know, slim and with uh, thin and, uh, and you know, light uh, lines. And, and in this instance, uh, the committee felt that, uh, you know, the, the design style uh, did not match the cues of the uh, uh, architectural language of the, of the building. And on top of that, it was very heavy. It is uh, minimally visible from the streets. Um, you know, it's it's obviously very high up, and you know the, the the visibility from the street was not really our concern. But it is obviously extremely visible from uh, top of the rock, which is uh, you know a a, a viewing platform, and uh, and we felt it was important to actually keep this experience in mind. Uh, so what the committee is saying is that we're not opposed to a, a, a viewing platform built on top of uh, top of the rock, uh, but this particular design expression was not appropriate. So we uh, pass a resolution that is a, uh, a conditional approval. Basically, we like everything and we're expressing our concern for uh, this viewing platform design. And the vote was, uh, um, I think, 13 to 0, 0. Okay. Does anyone have a conflict with this resolution? Are there any questions to the resolution? David. Yeah, Layla, uh, maybe I'm crazy. It seems like, especially to build a new doorway, that they're going to be breaking and tearing apart original fabric of the building. And that looks possibly like what's going to happen on the top of the rock as well. It looks like there's going to be so much going on that it will be destroying some of the original fabric. Am I wrong? So for, for the entrance, what's happening at the ground floor, uh, basically we took our cues from the, uh, the master plan that they recently uh, proposed and that we approved, where basically they have the flexibility to change some doors in two storefronts and change some storefronts into some doors and allow for the flexibility that is needed in order for uh, these uh, retail spaces to, to remain functional. So um, basically, you know, there has been this dance around, you know, they, at times, uh, you know, retail tenants want very large spaces and they want lots, lots of show windows. 
you know, that was more like in the uh, in the 80s and the 90s. And that's what they basically did. And uh, today there is more of a trend towards uh, you know, smaller retail spaces. So they, they are just trying to accommodate, uh, you know, the, these uses. In terms of the impact to the landmark itself, the fenestration remains the same. Uh, the materials remain the same. They're using uh, doors that have been approved in this master plan. Although this particular area was not specified in the master plan when they came to us, um, what they are proposing is consistent with uh, what LPC approved and what we actually recommended approval for. Okay, David. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question, Natalie. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. Layla, can you please talk a little bit about the beacon? And does that, I assume it's a light source, does that impact any of the local residences? Uh, so yes, it is lit. Um, it is uh, they're using LED uh, technology. So uh, it is uh, it is actually going to change uh, in in the course of the uh, the evening and the night. I can't remember what is the what are the hours, but I believe that it is not a all night affair. Um, we did not really uh, inquire about uh, the impact on residential buildings, uh, especially given that there's already a lot of illumination coming from the building, including, you know, the, uh, the of course, you know, the iconic uh, peacock sign that is on top of the building. Um, so, you know, th this is something that we uh, felt and given the historic precedence for lighting at that particular location and like beam, you know, back in, uh, in, in the 30s and the 40s, it was like beam lighting, uh, you know, in, in, in li like a lighthouse. Um, so this did, did not rise to the level of concern um, for, the, uh, for the committee. Once again, you know, we are the, the Landmarks Committee, so we don't really deal with uses. We really deal with, uh, you know, historic uh, preservation and appropriateness. Okay, thank Natalie. You. Thank you. Question answered, Leila. Appreciate oh, it. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see that uh, Mike Quebec. Yes, I in committee. I voted. I, I was opposed. I just want to mention that I will be changing my vote for reasons of uh, my own. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, let's see, I think that's it. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Any comments? All right, um, Layla, are you bundling? Sure, let's okay. bundle. Okay. Um, Okay, the next um, application is uh, 744 Fifth Avenue. The applicant is uh, Van Cleef and Arcos, a uh, French jeweler and uh, watch uh, manufacturer. Uh, the building is the Bergdorf Goodman building and it is the, uh, uh, the Fifth Avenue and uh, 47th Street corner. So uh, Van Cliff has been the, uh, the retail tenant there for uh, many, many years. Um, and they are basically proposing two things. It's actually two separate applications. The first one is they want to relocate signage. They have a uh, pin mounted metal signage on the, uh, on the facade. Uh, the, the, the letters are actually fairly big and it spreads along the, uh, the, the breadth of uh, you know, the, their share of the, of the facade. They basically want to put smaller signs, uh, but instead of having one large one, they want to have two small ones. Well positioned, uh, no uh, uh, alteration to the, uh, to, to the, the, the masonry or uh, the stone of, uh, of the facade. It's done very uh, tastefully, tactfully, no illumination. Uh, and uh, we felt that there was no issue with the, with the signage. Uh, the second uh, application, which you know, they, they came uh, as uh, jointly uh, to, uh, to present that to us, is that um, they have uh, over the, uh, the years uh, basically gone into uh, enjoying doing uh, temporary installations to the facade. 
So, uh, you know, it's a theme thing. Uh, this last spring, they basically slapped giant flowers uh, on the facade of, uh, of the building. Uh, and they had another one where uh, it was, you know, sort of like weaving material that was made to look like a basket or something like that. And um, this is, you know, very consistent with some uh, animations that uh, happen in the during the holiday season on other buildings. Uh, Cartier is a good example where, you know, they get this beautiful red bow and uh, and they, they do those, uh, uh, you know, activation of, of the building itself. In that particular case, because they have done two already and they want to do more, they now have to go through this whole uh, complicated review process that uh, involves coming to the community board. Basically, they want permission for a master plan that would allow them to basically put up these temporary uh, installations um, pretty much at their will. And the parameters for uh, this master plan would be that they would only use the existing anchors that exist on the building and that allow for the support of uh, these temporary installations. The installations would be for three months at a time and not longer unless LPC would approve it and that would not come to us. So it, it would be at the discretion of LPC, but the rule would be no more than three months. And then there would have to be two months in between. Uh, we actually had a really long uh, conversation on this item because people felt that, you know, if it's uh, three months at a time, uh, you know, spaced by two months, it's basically not really temporary. It becomes a permanent affair. And the temporary thing is actually having a, an, an unobstructed facade. In any case, after a long and uh, you know, thorough uh, and robust discussion, uh, the committee voted to recommend approval, uh, both of the signage and the temporary insulation. Okay, does uh, anyone have a conflict with this application? Are there any questions to the resolution? Are there any comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to 21 East 21st, Brett Leila. Yeah, so okay. 21 East 21st, uh, it's in the Ladies Mile Historic District. Um, it is a, uh, a six story uh, residential building. And uh, the applicant is actually proposing to convert the, uh, the basement level. You know, it's one of those, um, it's actually called Chicago style basements where basically you have, a, you know, sort of like a half floor that uh, you go down a couple of stairs and that accesses your, your basement that is uh, semi exposed. And then you have a stoop that goes up and your, uh, your you know, main floor, first floor is actually slightly raised, uh, elevated from, uh, from the street level. So the applicant is proposing to basically convert these two um, uh, stories of the building into a restaurant, which currently it is a residential use. Um, in order to do that, they want to make uh, some pretty drastic alterations to, uh, to the, the, the facade at this level. And they basically want to chop off the entire facade uh, that is, uh, you know, beautiful. You, you have actually a uh, uh, photograph uh, in your package on uh, page 12. And you can see, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, historic with, uh, you know, nice proportionate windows and uh, nice uh, intricate brick brickwork and stone. And um, they basically want to remove that and they want to put this uh, you know, big uh, window like glass panes of, uh, of uh, window. The uh, applicant is also proposing in order to provide, uh, to be uh, ADA compliant, they're proposing to install an, um, an elevator that basically is not approved in New York City. Um, they were actually unsure as to what the approval process uh, is and what it would entail, but nonetheless, they wanted this design to be, to be approved. Um, basic in, you know, is that they are uh, replacing a door uh, that is, you know, the entrance to the building, um, which is, you know, his historic uh, with a door that is non-historic and very plain. Uh, 
Uh, overall, we felt that there was no consideration given to uh, the, the uh, historic fabric of the, of the district. Um, we felt that you know it was uh, putting way too much historic fabric into the dumpster and uh, really not, not acceptable for the historic district. So we voted unanimously to deny the application. Okay, does anyone have a conflict with this application? Are there any questions to the resolution? Are there any comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the last resolution in landmarks. Okay, the last reso is, uh, it's basically for two buildings, uh, 1123, 1133 Broadway uh, under the same ownership. And uh, for uh, the same reasons, which is uh, to provide uh, compliance with uh, sprinkler rules in uh, those buildings, the applicant is proposing to install uh, wood water tanks on the roof. Minimal visibility, uh, the water tanks are actually, uh, I mean, it's a forest of water tanks in this particular uh, neighborhood. They're very contextual. Uh, we find them to be historically appropriate. Um, they will not be visible from any uh, primary facades of these buildings. Uh, we felt it was uh, well done and we approved it unanimously. Okay. Any conflicts with this application? Any questions with this resolution? And are there any comments? A lot of work this month. Great yeah, work. We were busy. Yeah, it was great work on the part of the committee. Okay, seeing none, we will take these four bundled resolutions to a vote. Yang. Yang. Yes. Waylon. Yes. Webb. Yes. Stern. No on. Yes. Okay. Spence. Yes. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Smith. Yes. Slutskin. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. Hero. Yes. Miller. Yes. Livese. Yes. Leone. Yes. Le Levy. Is, uh, is he still on? Okay, I'll come back to him. Um, Lagasico. Yes. Uh, Kinsella. Yes. Kalifarski. Yes. Kang. Kong. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Harris. Yes. Haas. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Chu. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Behar. Yes. Uh, Athenale. Yes. Michaelis. Yes. And Levy is a yes. Yeses. Okay. They all pass. Thank you very much. And we move on to parks and public spaces. Clayton. Thank you. We've got two resos. I'd like to have them deemed red. So deemed. And let's bundle them. Okay. So the first is. Uh, event application from Momentum on behalf of Verizon for a marketing event in Bryant Park, September 17th, 24th. So this is an event in the packet. There is an image of the location on page 15. It is a small footprint of an event near the fountain at the Fountain Terrace um, bordering 6th Avenue. And the event would, the event such as it is, is basically an eight by eight cube 
that is promoting a augmented reality experience that members of the public can delightfully engage with by holding up their phone and scanning a QR code that is present on the side of the glorious cube. Um, you can read the resolution about the details about there's one staff member, there's no sound, there's no filming. Many of the things that we're concerned about are, are not present at this event whatsoever. Um, there was a little bit of questioning and concern because we didn't have a lot of details about the logo. And one thing we were worried about was that there would be a big, huge Verizon sign facing Sixth Avenue. Anyone who was paying attention in 2014 might remember that Verizon did an event with a much larger tent than this. It took over the, the whole frontage of Sixth Avenue with a big, huge billboard that was lit up and movie screens and all kinds of craziness after hours all night long totally horrible. So um, given that we didn't have any details about the specifics at the time of the committee meeting, we did vote to deny unless they provided us more details about the logo and signage and also about illumination on the structure. And in the interim, they did respond to that. And it was a satisfying version of events when the community board uh, public hearing policy works, which is that the maybe I shouldn't say pressure, but the public conversation that was had with the applicant about the event, um, I think did figure into their, their decisions and we got renderings and details and the Verizon logo is not the logo that is going to be um, prominently displayed on the cube. It is the word hidden, which is the name of the VR thing, I guess. Uh, and it's not super bold and colorful and crazy. And the illumination is a 100 watt solar powered bulb that didn't really rise to the level of concern we that we would have had yeah. and using the matrix that we always use as a guideline we did unanimously uh vote um again at the time voted to deny unless but given that the applicant met those conditions um mm -hmm. it is now what you're seeing before you in the resolution packet is an approval of the event okay does anyone have a conflict with this application Are there any questions to the resolution? Are there any comments? Okay, seeing none, we can go to the second one. Second one. Right, the second application is for Madison Square Park Conservancy for <laughs> an event that is being sponsored by American Express in Madison Square Park. The location of this event also is shown in the Rezo packet you're probably familiar with this at this point, it's been years that the Conservancy has worked with us to always ensure that these events occur in the gravel areas in the Northwestern area of the park, kind of adjacent to Shake Shack. So back in, back in more horrifying years, there were events and cars and stuff in the middle of the lawn. And um, happily, that, that is not what we're looking at. So this is a this is an event by American Express, which is kind of like a work remote, we're here to support you working kind of event. I leave it to others to talk about how that is branding. I don't know. But basically there are these things plopped down in the gravel that could allow you to plug your laptop in and sit in the park and work. Um, and there is a payphone structure that you can use to have you know some merciful silence for your incredibly important business call that you're placing from inside the park. Um, most of our questions were really about COVID protocol, uh, rightfully so, and so the resolution has a lot of specifics about what they're doing in that regard. And I won't go over all of it now, but there are there are plans for what what should happen if if this actually becomes a wildly popular event with like queues around the corner, um, which I don't think anyone really anticipates. But it is a uh, it is one of the four annual marketing events that is allowed for Madison Square Park Conservancy, and the time has come for these events to occur again. And I think that, on balance, we are um, glad to see that there is income coming to the conservancy at a time that things have been so insane. So, um, using the matrix again, we, we unanimously recommended approval of this event. Okay. Does anyone have a conflict with this application? A question to the resolution? Are there any comments? 
Okay, mm -hmm. seeing none, we will vote on the last resolution and then we have a report from uh, Renee from the BEX committee. So I'll vote right now. Bayless. Yes. Athenale. Yes. Behar. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Chu. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Goshow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Payback. Yes. Hang. Yes. Uh, Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. I, you said he, I see, you're muted, yes. but I saw you say yes. yes. Sorry I, about yes. That. I read your, I read your lips. Uh, Lagasica. Yes. Levy is a yes. I'll confirm that. Uh, Leone. Yes. Livese. Yes. Uh, Miller. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. Slutskin is a yes. Smith. Yes. Spandorf. Yes. Spence. Yes. Stern. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. And Yang. Yes. Passes. Okay. Thank you very much. We now have a report from Renee of the Bex Committee. Thank you, Vicki. Um, just very briefly, we had two presentations. First, from the Times Square Alliance, um, which gave us some great information on the um, uptick in ped counts there um, and a new app that they have um, and the text ability that they have. If people see something in the district, they can immediately text or use the app to contact the Times Square Alliance who can address it. Um, we also had a, had a presentation from an expert in data, data privacy. Um, that's something that Bex is monitoring. I think we heard earlier that um, Council Member Powers was, um, support, had supported a bill that recently passed that allowed um, um, the restaurants in our district to gain information when an intermediary, when people had ordered from an intermediary. So that's something that we are following um, and the expert provided a lot of information. It was an attorney who works in the field um, on this issue. But I really just wanted to say and ask um, to make a quick reminder that the BEX committee is right now putting together our annual submission of budget requests. And we're also putting together the community needs statement. And so we would really like everyone on the board and those who live, work and visit the district to fill out the survey that we have on, C on the CB5 website, because this really helps inform the requests as well as the district needs statement. Um, also, if you've seen a need or identified a need, um, please contact me, Marisa or anybody on the BEX committee, because then we can include that in the conversations um, about the requests. And, and these are gonna be presented at the next board. Um, that's it. From that. And that's on our website, right, Renee? Yes, the, yeah. the survey's on our website, and I would encourage everybody to please respond. Okay. Really Sorry, I actually, the survey's not currently up on our website. We will oh. get it up next week. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry about that, Marissa. I thought we had. Okay, we'll get it up next week. Got it. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, if there's no further business, that concludes the evening's business uh, tonight. It turned out very nicely. And I thank you all. Have a great rest of your evening and a wonderful weekend coming up. See you all next month at committee meetings. Bye, everybody. Good night. Meeting adjourned. Thanks, Good night.